the connected era, information is always at your fingertips. What makes your message stand out? In this series, we are going to meet a diverse range of people whose messages are influencing the masses. Let's find out how. In this episode, we are going to have an insightful conversation with an amazing man, an amazing person that I am a big fan of, Joseph Rodriguez. Joseph uncovered his passion for entrepreneurship when he was very young, at the age of 15 years old. After hitting a ceiling on his entrepreneurial growth, he dedicated 10 years in corporate America, learning about systems, processes, and big businesses, building and management methodologies. In 2009, he left corporate and uh, with a wealth of experience and understanding, he connected back to his entrepreneurial roots and started his IT business which he grew to service 50 plus clients in Toronto, Canada area. After a few years, he began selling of his clients to other IT firms and he started an amazing YouTube channel based on his deep passion for sharing valuable information, experiences with other entrepreneurs. A few years later, his YouTube channel is just skyrocket in popularity, turning his art and labor of love into successful business with multiple revenue streams. Welcome to Goy Connect, Joseph Rodriguez. Finally, we have you here. It's an honor to have you here with us, connecting all the way from Toronto, Canada. Connecting to our Actually, I'm, I'm in California right now. <laughs> oh, okay, so California. I'm all over the place, so that's, I understand. Yeah, that's correct, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for connecting from California then. You're and uh, connecting to our space of Gallery of Ideas, a space where we try through insightful conversations to give to our communities a, an opportunity to learn from brilliant minds, creative souls, people like yourself, people that are creating value in our society. And uh, today we're very excited to have you here to learn a little bit more about your story, about your drive, and to get absorb a little bit of your knowledge and wisdom. So thank you for joining us and uh, welcome, Joseph. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for having me on here. I've been excited to be on. I know we talked about this last year and I've been anticipating it. So that's I'm true. excited. Yeah, that's true. So Joseph, the first question that, um, you know, actually we talked about you with different people here in Barcelona. And um, I actually got some of the questions from the audience that I really wanted to ask you this question. So the first one, tell us a little bit more about your background, your fascinating life and uh, what pushed you to get into the entrepreneurial world? Yeah, so I grew up uh, very entrepreneurial. I knew a deep down inside that I was an entrepreneur. It's just I didn't have the confidence to actually you know, build upon that foundation at an early stage. But when I was 17 and 18 years old, I did do some things with the internet. And I was getting these checks sent to me. And it was weird because I had to go to the bank and open up a bank account. I didn't tell my family because no one believed it. Everyone thought I was just kind of playing around on the computer. And I was getting these checks sent to me because I'd create these like passive income business with like advertising and so forth. But I didn't have the mentorship. I really didn't even know what entrepreneurship was. Um, so I just kind of stopped it and I went down the route. I ended up actually dropping out of high school. I don't know if I've ever mentioned that publicly, but uh, because I had a difficult time learning, but I also learned at a later stage that and my learning style was different. And we can talk more about that in a moment, but uh, what ended up happening was I ended up getting a corporate job very early. Actually, I was almost 20. When I got a corporate job, I was really young. And uh, I learned the very important elements of dealing and the ability to communicate effectively. So I was able to communicate how I had really good computer background skills and so forth. So they brought me in and that taught me a lot of things about business, about productivity, about management. And I invested a lot of time in corporate and, um, you know, I didn't end up going the entrepreneurial route. I ended up going the corporate route. But then I got uh, kind of, you could say, haunted by two books that I read. Uh, yeah. It was The Alchemist. Which ones? Which ones? <laughs> yeah, The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Oh, a Brazilian one. Okay. And uh, The 4-Hour Workweek by Timothy Ferris. So yeah. Alchemist talks about, you know, chasing your passion and chasing your dream and it rekindled the flame in, in me about entrepreneurship. And at that time, I had, like, I had bought my own house. I had a motorcycle. I had a car. I was doing well in corporate. And I worked really hard. I put long hours and, and just worked my way up in corporate. But I felt this drive to, to leave it and uh, start a business. And the four-hour work week was talking about passive income businesses and all this stuff that I, I was kind of dabbling with 10 years prior to that. And I'm like, 
whoa, I guess people are doing this to a higher scale now. And they have this cool lifestyle where they get to travel and they create valuable businesses that, you know, benefit the lives of others. And they have a lot of control of the dynamics and all these exciting things. Long story short, I ended up leaving and I started out with an IT business and I grew that and got it up to about 50 clients and I started selling off my clients. And in 2013, I reduced everything to living out of a backpack because my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend at the time was from Austria and I went to go live in Austria for a while. So I reduced everything to living out of a backpack and I wanted to figure out what I was going to do next. So that was the genesis of the YouTube channel. Actually, the first video was the living out of the backpack video. So that's the rough background, like condensed story of how I got to where I am right now with the YouTube channel. And talking about your YouTube channel, how did you, um, what was the main drive to create the, the channel that you have today, which is very successful and you have so many admirers, so many followers, so many people that admire you so much. I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> what big fan. So how, what was the drive? How did you get to that point where you said, okay, I have to do this and, uh, and, um, this is what I need. And that's the process that I have to follow. Yeah. You know, I'm a big fan of experimenting. Like that's my, one of my key things. You got to try a lot of things. And when I got out of the IT area, I got out of it because I wanted a more remote based business and I wanted to be able to do things. And I was trying to figure out what to do. So I was trying a whole bunch of things. So I, I made the minimalism video and I thought I was going to get into the, the minimalism niche and talking about that because it really helped me with focus and concentration and resourcefulness, which is something that I'm really big on. And uh, I started doing all these like, kind of random videos, figuring out, and I started doing these book discussions because I'm like, what if I share my experience, my business experience, and what I had from corporate as well as an entrepreneurship through these book discussions, what would happen? Mm -hmm. And that was the genesis of that because what would happen was people would send me messages and say, those are great book discussions. I love how you share your insights and perspectives. I would Love it if you would do this book and that book and this book and so forth. And that was like in the earlier stages when I had less than a few hundred subscribers. Wow. <laughs> it's just like, um, you know, watching your channel today and the way it's, um, you know, the, the way people interact with you every time you release a video, uh, to, to watch all these hundreds of comments, hundreds <laughs> of people from all over the world. No, it's so beautiful. I get touched just reading People's comments it's interesting to see how things evolved. I mean, you know, when I, when retrospect, you know, Steve Jobs had a really good quote, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So what's interesting is that if you learn core business skills, communication skills, all the important elements of business and connecting with others and so forth, and you keep just working on yourself and then you do things, you can easily identify what is going to work and how to pursue that till it gets to a higher and higher level. So I recognized at a certain point that, you know, I got to start paying more attention to that. And I was doing these other things like consulting, I was doing affiliate deals, I was doing all these different information products I was creating for productivity and so forth. And then I recognized the importance of diversification too. Like, you know, you can do like 10 or 20 different things and then you, one or two of those things will pick up traction and then you'll recognize that the traction is building. So it would make sense to maybe reduce some of the other things you're doing and put emphasis on this. And that was really what happened over the last few years. But I think one of the big realizations for me of that, that it was going to lead into something big was when I was in Austria, actually, I made a video, which is still on my channel, which was in the, one of the earlier formats I was explaining uh, video content, or I was, I was just playing around with. And it's called uh, five insights from a podcast. And the concept was essentially five insights from any podcast I listened to that was something that I believe would be valuable for the listener. And I did a, a discussion on uh, I Love Marketing podcast with Jeff Moore. Jeff Moore actually found that video. And oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he found the video. And the next thing you know, he brings me in and he hires me as a consultant, flies me down to L.A. And all, this, um, all these doors started opening up. And I realized that, wow, um, you know, it, it's amazing just how much reach and the power of YouTube mm -hmm. or just social media in general. And it's probably worth investing more time looking at other opportunities in this area as the next business that I was going to get into. So that's what was going on with that. And I have to add something else as well. The power of your content, because you can have, uh, you know, there are many millions of sites and in in different channels in the YouTube, but I guess if you have a weak content, you know, that's going to be, you know, just something else out there. I think your content is so special. And uh, I'm sure you're going to get to 
millions and millions of subscribers because as people get to know you and see you, everyone that introduce you uh, your videos and your channel people just they get addicted to you they can stop watching and listening to to your book reviews and uh, your study notes so I believe your content it's uh, it's key Joseph it's really important obviously you know that <laughs> and you keep improving in and because you are a very uh, critical know it yourself you keep looking for that improvement well, thank thanks for endorsing me and 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 for uh, supporting me on the journey I, I appreciate it and recognizing mm -hmm. thank you yeah. so, Joseph that are many many people talking about you writing reviews doing many things i just collected a few of these comments that i read in your site and on your youtube channel and uh, you have people saying things about you like this you are a genius you are helping so many people you are changing people's lives your work is a valuable gift to society your your work is mind-blowing i mean with all this how do you feel and how I mean, from all this gratification of this work and having these people around you telling all these things, people that don't even know you, how do you feel? And uh, it has been always like this. Tell us a little bit more. You know, I started to get earlier indicators that what I was creating was helping others. Like they would leave comments like that. So what I would do is I, you know, like with anything I do in business or anything I do in life as I study the feedback, like I'm a, a big fan of the direct response marketing principles which is essentially means that you, you put out something and you see how the marketplace responds. And then what you do is that based on the response, you continue to amplify what's working, remove, strip away what's not working and so forth. So number one, it was very you know, exciting and humbling and very encouraging that I was getting this kind of feedback. And number two, it also helped me realize what content I needed to create next to add more value. Because yeah. I believe the focus when we create content should be about how much we can provide in a concentrate. So even though my videos are very long, I try to fit as much concentrate that I believe will resonate with the audience. So what I do is I connect with the audience. I try to figure out what their pains, their frustrations are, their goals and, I, and their desires. And then from there, I'm able to adjust and speak to that, what they're experiencing, provide them the solutions in a way that's not telling them what to do, but it's very conversational with them. It's a very yeah. conversational tone. And as a result, you know, they, they, they experience behavioral change from that. They take action, they produce results and they come back with comments like that, which again, you know, just keeps feeding that loop. Yeah. And what about uh, criticism? I don't know. I never seen anyone saying any bad feedback or bad review, but have you ever received some bad reviews that you thought, mm, uh, this is wrong? I think this person, because you know, not every bad review means they are really actually correct, right? So, I mean, so many people, they have different tastes, different views, and it doesn't mean that what they're saying is correct. But tell us a bit more how you handle criticism. Yeah, you know, uh, I handle it in a few ways. So number one is I accept any kind of comment, if it's a positive comment or negative comment or a criticism or whatever, because all of it has insightful information that I could use for optimization. Not all my videos are going to resonate with most of my audience some videos might resonate more with some of the audience some videos with the other audience uh, segment of my audience and a lot of people find my videos through searching for various topics related to the discussions that I have and they find my videos and it might not be what they're looking for it's in a format that it might not be in the kind of format that they consume information in and so forth and what I believe with uh, the negative comments or any kind of criticism that I get it's uh, really just an indication of my uh, marketing efforts or areas that I need to improve on. And yeah, sometimes, you know, it can be kind of really like harsh criticism and stuff. And yeah. I recognize that, um, you know, with the online world is that people do express themselves a lot more intensely because that's True. how it is. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's some seedlings of truth in there and I don't take all of the criticism and apply it because, you know, someone might have a, a strong bias towards one way of how they would like my content to be created. And then they'll say, you know, like so I've had, I've had a few that have said, you know, you should shorten your videos, make them like five minutes. Why do you talk for like an hour and a half? But I also get a lot that ask me to create you know, two, three hour videos. The one I did on the thinking grow rich a few weeks ago was almost three hours. Right. So it depends. I, any type of feedback that I get, whether it's positive or negative, I evaluate it based on my business model and the kind of contribution I want to make, 
the personality of who I am, my style, my because I kind of see this as an art as well, and a ton of other variables. And then looking at it from that objective perspective allows you to dissect a lot out of these comments, whether it be positive or negative, which will help you build your content further. That's what I found. Any time you put yourself out there in a public environment or a public place, you're going to face some sort of criticism. And that just comes with the territory. And I look at this as an exercise too, because it's not necessarily what happens to you, but how you respond to it. Absolutely. And it's always important to respond with compassion and recognize that people are in different stages. And some provide criticism from one perspective, some provide it from another perspective. Some have a certain way of, of mm. providing that criticism. Some people see reality differently, but the very strong polarizing viewpoint. And everybody's entitled to their opinions. And what matters and what is very important to keep in consideration is the audience that you serve, who you are, and the value that you're creating and your beliefs and your morals and so forth. You know, tons of variables, but it's really a, how you respond to it that has the biggest impact on and not just like responding back to the comment but what you do with the elements that are contained within criticism and how do you take that and apply it if applicable to building the value that you're creating for others correct i always think about that yeah no it's a very good point so when someone critiques you it's how you take exactly what you're saying it really there's this behavior mm -hmm. um, emotional behavior that you have to take in consideration um i've heard you say many times that we need to learn how to learn, right? That uh, in many other places out there, people teach you what to learn, but not how to learn. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear more from you on these thoughts and uh, to see how you expand on this. Yeah, so we live in a time right now where there's tons of information. Like we experience information load on a daily basis. What to learn, what area of the subject to learn first, what source to learn from. Like these are the dilemmas that we have nowadays. Back in the days, it would, you would travel across the world to learn a very specialized skill. Sure. That being said, we have to keep into consideration some of the important practices of accelerated learning. And mm -hmm. so we need to look at how we learn, how we study, how we take what we learn and apply. If it's a business or personal development context, are we doing it in the most effective way or are we doing it in a way where we're not getting much results or we're feeling overwhelmed. So we really need to evaluate the learning process. And what's interesting is that not, we don't actually invest a lot of time in it. And I think nowadays people are investing a lot more time figuring out what are the best ways to learn, what are the best sources to learn from, like all the different kinds of things related to learning how to learn, which is a very broad subject. But I believe it's one of the most important skills you can have today is to figure out your learning style and then couple that with some accelerated learning and learning best practices, dedicating some time to actually studying the different learning modalities and incorporating that in whatever skill you're trying to develop, whatever it is you're trying to learn, because that's going to give you results a lot faster. And I find that to be true from my own personal experience. Hmm. And uh, Joseph, do you think, because I think of myself as an addicted to learning, I've been always addicted to learning. Do you see yourself a little bit addicted to learning as well? Yes, I think it's a natural state for the brain to be in to learn. And if we don't like learning, it might be, at least that was the case for me when I was in school, that we're not learning from the modality that we learn in. And so what's interesting is I want to share this is that uh, one of my models for learning that I, I use in the learning how to learn realm is uh it's called a format learning model format like number four m-a-t and it works like this okay there's four quadrants and there's many of these learning models and it's, i think it's important to incorporate as many as you can till you find the sweet spot that works well for you four types of learners fundamentally and even though we have overlap in these types of learning we tend to have a bias for one versus the other so it's a quadrant essentially and there's why learners, what learners, how learners, and what if learners. Why learners, wow. interesting, right? <laughs> why learners wow. tend to learn to be able to educate others. So they want to learn why something is the way it is. Why, why, why? Because they're like the salespeople, right? Salespeople usually want to know why so they can tell it to somebody else because that's how they learn. And when they get a lot of why information, they believe they've got a high level of comprehension as to what they're learning. 
what learners are theoretical breakdown. They like the concepts, the scientific evidence, the supporting data, you know, broken it down into different parts, components that make up the whole heavy theory, which is also important. You know, we don't want to neglect, but some of those what learners have a strong bias towards that. They're not interested necessarily in the what, why, but they might be more emphasizing the what. And then there's the how learners, which are usually the technicians. They, they learn through doing. So uh, those that will get an idea, watch a YouTube video, and then actually go and try it, they'll learn a lot from the, the, the hands-on experience of building something. And those are the, the how learners. And then there's a what if, which is kind of like how I am. Actually, I'm a lot more biased than the what if, which is not a area that's focused a lot upon in school, which is how do you take what you're learning here and apply it towards like making money or business or some of that. So what if learners might be mm. watching uh, this video right now and figuring out how they can take components from what they're watching in this video and integrate it into maybe they're doing a business where they interview people or maybe they're going to apply what they're learning here in a way that you never even thought of that they were going to apply to further a result. So mm. when we're studying and we're learning, I think it's important to figure out what quadrant, what part of that we have a bias towards and, and learn from that perspective and then understand that we, you know, it's also good to diversify all four, but that gives us a huge level of confidence as to who we are as a person and how we see reality. Oh, that's beautiful. And do you actually teach this? Do you have um, training programs where you teach this into depth? Yeah, I actually have a mind map training program that I created on my site, uh, online training for entrepreneurs, which is about, I think it's like 12 or 13 hours of, all these different learning models overlaid and implemented in the process of mind mapping. Cause in my videos, I integrate all these in order to be able to learn the information, but also be able to teach. And that's one of the most important elements in there is actually to, in order to become good at learning, we have to learn how to teach, which again is a, is kind of very polarizing uh, information. We don't, we don't often think about that, but if you want to get good at learning, you actually also have to get good at teaching. If you want to get good at teaching, you also have to get good at learning, right? It's a very it's yeah. a cybernetic loop. And I remember you said once um, that you teach what you learn or no. How was that phrase that you said? You teach what you like. We always teach the things that we need to learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> oh, that's we one of my favorite business. Things that we, we want to learn. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Right. You know, it's we're, what we're passionate about that we teach others are is information that we can integrate to a higher degree uh, ourselves. You'll find this to be true with a lot of like consultants and, and uh, a lot of people in the personal development and business world. You'll find yeah. this to be true. And it's not a negative thing. It's actually insightful. It tells us. It's a, a, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, yeah. we, we have also training programs where we teach public speaking and communication. And for me, I'm always the first one trying to understand how can I learn more about communications in every, every situation, every meeting, everywhere. I'm paying attention to every detail, uh, aside from the fact that I am completely fascinated for body language and all this. Is, this is really an area of expertise for me because I'm completely fascinated by it since I was uh, a child. But the whole thing of learning more and more, even though I teach that, but I keep just looking for more and more to learn in order to increase more knowledge in, in our training. So it, it's, it makes total sense. You cannot teach something that you're not interested in learning. How can you actually even do that? It would be unfair to the people that are with you trying to, to go through a learning process. Yes. Well, yeah, you're sense. in a very advantageous position because you get access to a lot of these insights and perspectives and different speakers' ways of becoming effective communicators. And then you can take that information and integrate it, improve your own communication skills, attract more people. And it's a very, it's a very powerful cycle, right? It is. It is. It's, it's wonderful. So next question. Uh, okay. Your main message to, to the audience. So um, what would be the main message that you would like to give to people uh, from all your work, from your life experience, something that is very unique that you don't actually mention a lot in your channel because it's not maybe the time and place, but something that you'd like to share with the audience that I'm sure there are many of these people that follow you that are now maybe watching this and will watch maybe in the future. So what would be their message to these people uh, that are, you know, admiring you and following your work and your beautiful work? You know, I like the, I like the word resourcefulness. And when I reflected back as to why I was fascinated by minimalism, it reminds me a lot of in 
when I was young, we grew up in very humble beginnings and we used to find great joy in things that a lot of people, um, you know, they had an abundant amount of resources and toys and different kinds of things, but we used to work with what we have and create a lot of joy and stuff like that. And it was a great experience for me because I carried that with me all towards life. And then as I started to get more success in business and be able to afford to do a lot of different things, I maintained that as an exercise because I recognized that in uh, business or when it comes to books or anything we're learning or anything like that, we don't always get the most out of, not even close. In fact, I don't even think we get more than 20% out of the uh, utilization or effectiveness or the output of whatever it is that we're using, the resource, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, uh, for example, one of the things I learned from Jay Abraham, one of my mentors, is that you could take an asset that exists in a business and you could repurpose, multi-purpose, repackage, redistribute. You can offer it on a, a like a percentage for this person. You could take that asset. You do all kinds of things with one little element in the business, but if we don't practice resourcefulness, we're not able to see those opportunities that exist. So I think resourcefulness is like the biggest thing that is the most valuable lesson in a time today where we're bombarded with tons of opportunities and tons of resources. We also, in order to be able to work with that, have to value the, the present. You know, this is very much related to the power of now by Eckhart Tolle, which is a really amazing book. It's about resourcefulness of the moment, you know, like this is some amazing stuff. So I like the word resourcefulness. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that's a brilliant uh, message to give to everyone. We, I, I think when, when you have that burning desire, which is, uh, yeah, I'm going to totally use that one because uh, <laughs> our next event. <laughs> uh, you have Napoleon Hill to thank for that one. I am in love with that one. <laughs>there are many people that say, okay, I'd love to, to become a singer. I'd love to become a, a journalist. I'd love to do this. I'd love to do that. But I don't have the right, you know, time. I don't have the right occasion. I don't have the right uh, economic status, what's so on and so on. Yeah. And that's what becomes resourcefulness. If you really want to do something. I remember starting our first event, you know, everyone was thinking for the interviews we did was all like in my living room. There was you know, no big studio. There was nothing, just a mobile phone and, uh, and uh, some people holding some lights and, and, you, know, <laughs> and you just find a way because you wanted to do something. There's that burning desire of doing something. And if you're not resourceful, you're never going to do anything. If you expect, if we expect that right moments where there's an abundance, abundance of money, uh, a perfect location, the perfect actor or situation that is going to take your hand and say, okay, I believe in yeah. you. You're never going to do anything, you know, yeah. because, the, and I totally agree. I think resources, it's, it's an amazing concept that should be applied in any situation, not only professional, but also in personal life. We yeah. have to become more and more and stop with the nonsense that it goes yeah, and, on. And it's such a fun exercise to practice resourcefulness, to start something and say, how do we maximize the different resources that we're using right now to create this? And also recognize that we might think we're doing it in the best way, but there's infinite amount of possibilities that we're not looking at and to just sit back and reflect and, and yeah. see if you can be, uh, see reality from a different perspective or look at things from a different perspective, like a paradigm, you know, somebody sees one thing as a obstacle, another person sees it as an opportunity and list goes on and on and on. And there's tons of books of, that are paradigm shifters to get you to look at things differently. Like one of my okay. favorite books is uh, Jay Abraham's uh, Abraham Mind Shift Challenge. And it's just a whole bunch of different scenarios of utilizing assets and business to create like these sub businesses and so forth. And you just like read a book like that and you, your brain just starts to fire and you start to say, oh, not because you want to copy exactly what you're learning, but you no. think of what you've got and how you can daisy chain what you've got to create something. And it's just amazing. I love that kind of stuff. That stuff gets me really excited. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I get excited watching you doing the reviews on that and just listening to you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's double excitement. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, no, it's a gift huh? because actually that, drive, that takes me to the next question that, uh, that we have for you. Uh, there are many people that come to me and say, oh, Patty, you know, uh, I, I know you love reading and you, know, you love knowledge and, and reading uh, audio, you know, 
reading books, listening to audiobooks. It's something that has been always with me. But, um, you know, I can never be really like you, even though I like it, but I don't have the right time. I, you know, I'm too busy with the kids. I'm too busy at work. And, uh, and that's the thing. I said, well, there are many other ways. If you don't have, you know, first of all, create some priorities you know, in your life and then do things that are according to your really to your priorities. But I'm sure there are some techniques that people can take. And that's one of the things that you teach as well, that maybe you, you can help right now telling people how to help these people that are so busy and they see themselves in a situation where they have no time to expand their knowledge, to read more, to, to be able to learn more other things. Yes. Uh, I believe that we are taught that when you got to read a book, you got to read it from cover to cover. And, you know, I do uh, these workshops through Iris Reading. Iris, uh, Paul Novak, founder of Iris, is one of my friends. And, you know, they're the largest North American speed reading company. And we, we come across this question all, uh, a lot when, when I do these workshops and so forth. But you don't need to read a book a cover from cover. It's important to recognize that even if you do read a book from cover to cover, that you're probably only extracting, even I would say this is being generous, 20% of the information and applying it. So thus would make sense to begin at the end, begin with the end in mind and figure out what you want to get out of the book. Yeah. Create a rough mind map of what you want to get out of the book. Then go into the book and pull out the 20% of information by flipping through the pages, looking at the table of contents. That is the most relevant for the outcome that you want to create as a result and pull up that information, read that first, study that first. And then you can even overlay that with the format model when you're taking your notes integrated into the format model and that's going to allow you to get through a whole book, get more comprehension out of it. Not when I say get through the whole book, I'm not talking about reading it from cover to cover, but I'm talking about using it in this format. You get a lot out of the book. You go and integrate, you apply it, and then you can decide later if you want to go and build back upon that. But if you, if you do that, you can get through a lot more material. So it's breaking the old paradigm saying you got to go through cover to cover. And there's, mm. that's one of the most valuable tips that I can give. Mm. You just said something very interesting. You mentioned studying a book. I think many people don't have that relationship with books. You know, I think some people, they just, they think I'm going to read a book just to, you know, uh, it's relaxed time or it's a moment to disconnect, right? Like when you watch a movie or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I think very few people look the way, you know, we do. Like if I'm reading this page, I have to take something out. I'm studying, yeah. you know. Is that, is that the material that I wanted to, is that kind of information that I wanted to keep, to, you know, reading for my, you know, or not? We're very selective with the information that we receive. At least I am very selective. So mm -hmm. if there's information that I'm like, no, this is not something that is really, there's no space for this right now. Yes. You know, yes. So I move quickly. I don't feel the guilt of, yes. oh, I have finished the book. You know, That's like good. you said, I haven't yeah. started from the beginning to the end and I have to finish. Because yeah. I guess, you, yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah, just exactly what you said. I agree with it 100%. It's uh, shifting your paradigm because look, you only get 24 hours in a day and there's way more information today than has ever been. So the opportunity to find, I, I'm a huge fan of the Pareto principle, 20% of the information that produces 80% of the results. And even when it comes to why I read and why I learn, it's for application. I don't want to just be theoretical. And I emphasize this a lot on my channel. I say 20% learning, 80% taking action because the actions you take is going to determine what you need to learn next. And then from there, you can find that really targeted, segmented information that's going to accelerate your understanding. And that's how I built my understanding and level of expertise. So when you go back and you say like, they call me a genius on my channel and stuff like that, I have an expertise in certain subjects a broad, very deep expertise in certain subjects because I followed this process. So in those areas, I might have a, a more than extraordinary knowledge, but there's a lot of areas that I don't have a lot of knowledge in and very even a, a very surface level knowledge in. But I'm also very clear as to how I want to live my life and what my contribution is, my purpose, my passion, and so forth. So I'm okay with not knowing everything. Okay, It's about, for me, knowing what I need to know to create what I want to create, which is the, the products, the business stuff, the value, the education for other entrepreneurs and so forth. So I, I'm able to like that sift and sort large volumes of information and pull out the most relevant and just keep building upon it that way. And we got to give ourselves permission to do that because if we don't, yeah. we're going to feel overwhelmed. We're going to feel really overwhelmed today because there's uh, analysis paralysis. You've heard of analysis that? Analysis paralysis. <laughs> yeah. Very common. 
Yeah, it's absolutely. And with regards, um, you know, the, the whole reading process, and I think finding that flow, you know, I mean, you also mm. read the, the study notes on, on Mihai Chicks and Mihai. Yes. And I think you have to find that where your skill meets challenge. If you know, in the case of the books that we're talking about, entrepreneurship, yeah. and because I'm also fanatic by this kind of books, um, and find that flow where you say, okay, I'm always looking for that a little bit more where, uh, you know, I already read this, but I need a little bit more and yeah. never stop. I said, okay, I read everything and I'm fine. I don't have time. Forget it. No. So mm -hmm. I think reading is a question to finding your flow in reading as well. Like yes. we do in surf, you know, I surf like, you know, you really, all the kids, we you learn surf? how to surf. Yeah, yeah. Even oh, here in Barcelona, yeah, sure. I have my surfboards, which we don't have waves in Barcelona, but uh, I take the kids on the, on the paddle. You know, the paddle I've, I've been so fascinated by surfing. I got to learn it. I've done some bodyboarding, uh, but I go and run by Redondo Beach here in California. You're in like California. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, I love watching the surfers. Oh, it's the other day I was, I was wow. sitting after my run, because I run Tuesdays and Thursdays, I sat in front of the water and I was doing was a very light meditation and I, I got to see the surfer in the water. It was so tranquil. And there was a dolphin. It was like jumping. Oh my yeah, goodness. It was, it was beautiful, right? <laughs> and what's interesting about California is it's very much got that vibe here, right? Like over mm -hmm. here, people, like it's, it's a premium to live here, right? It's not a, oh, it's this area that yeah. I, I'm in, which is the South Bay, uh, Los Angeles area and so forth. It is, uh, it is, it costs more to live here. So people got to work hard and they've got to make money to mm. be able to enjoy this life here. Yeah. However, they don't want to do it in a very intense way where they're like stressed. So they, they maintain a lot of people and some people do this better than others. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a delicate balance. I found with the culture here, it's very interesting of uh, being very smooth and flowing kind of like a surfer, but at the same time making all the, the fast moves. So yes. you'll find that uh, as an individual here, you'll do well in a place like this if you can maintain both a smoothness to yourself as well as a very uh, efficient, you know, very focused. Like you got to be able to do both here, which is why I like it. It's stimulating for my brain. So when are you going to start to get in some classes then? You have to start. Uh, talk a lot about that. As well. <laughs> should I, well, we're talking about if I come down to Barcelona, should I do it in Barcelona? Should I do it? Well, in I can teach you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the, the waves, it's a good way for you to learn. <laughs> Because, you know, in the Mediterranean, it's uh, here at least in Barcelona, we don't have the... And only if there's a storm. I totally well. believe that if I, if I learn how to surf, my videos would get better because then like the flowing, the, this oh, flow yeah. thing is, is <laughs> like a surfing concept, right? Flow, oh, yes, it's very yes. much a surfing concept. Well, it is, it is. <laughs> These guys that are, you know, aside from uh, Mihai Chiksim Mihai, but everyone that is involved in, in doing all this work uh, on flow, yeah. they all somehow, uh, they got involved in surf and there is something mm. in sports particularly obviously it's applicable to a mini you know anything but there's something about surf that really it's the perfect example because yeah, you need really lots is. of things there that it needs to be able to have the patience to wait for that wave and once the wave is coming you have to have the strength to swim and then to go down and come back and then swim again and go back again and it's you know it's a constantly skill and challenge non-stop so it's not something that you just go do once and that's it. Oh, it was great. Great shot of the adrenaline and that's it. No, surf is a continuous, you know, mm -hmm. that's why I guess they, they like to call it more as an example for flow because it's yeah. that process nonstop. So it's, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, I will help you if you come to Barcelona. All right. I'll take you up on that if I'm down there. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, you mentioned the imposter syndrome once in one of the, uh, but the book studies that um that you did from Austin Cleon, mm -hmm. still like an artist. Yes, I love that. Uh, it was you know I think I listened to that video five, six, ten times. I really enjoyed, it. <laughs> and um, I realized there are so many people so talent. So I, I have close friends and family you know, that are so talent, and they suffer from that. So what would be your advice to help these people to overcome? Well, first of all, explain a little bit more to, to everyone that is listening and watching to us about this imposter syndrome. And uh, what would be your advice to overcome that? So we all have expertise, okay? So even if we don't have a high level of expertise in contrast to maybe somebody that we admire, we have skills, we have abilities. And a lot of times we don't let those skills and abilities shine because we feel that we don't have the credentials, or for whatever reason, but usually when it comes to imposter syndrome, we don't want to let our abilities shine. We don't want to teach others. We don't want to start the business based on knowing 
uh, knowing that we can create the results, but we don't do it because we don't have the self-esteem or self-confidence. So it's really the imposter syndrome is, a, is an indication of lower self-esteem and self-confidence. Now, it, it manifests itself in a weird story in our mind saying that, who am I to do this? Who am I? Right. I don't have the credentials. I don't have the expertise and so forth, but it's important to recognize. Yeah. You know, it's important to recognize that there's a lot of success stories of individuals out there who have contributed. And I'm not talking about just the, you know, the, the facade of success, but I'm talking about the contributions that have been made as a result of not having the credentials or not having the formal, whatever that goes along the expertise that they have. There are people that, just get really high level of mastery in their craft just by going at it day in and day out, 10, 20 years. They have a lot of knowledge. They have a lot of experience, a lot more than others that have gone through maybe a formal education to get it because they can understand the nuances. And as a result of it, their information, when they put it out there, when they, you know, they write the books or they do the consulting or they teach on it is is serving to a large degree. And a lot of those individuals experience this imposter syndrome because we're being taught to say that if you don't have this, that, that you can't do it. And not maliciously you're taught that. It's just, it's just that's where it comes from. The way it was, yeah. The way it was taught to them, and then they just passed on from generations and generations. Now yeah, you know, one of the things we do is this is human nature, right, is we look around and see what everyone else is doing, and then we're going to base what we do based on that. And that's has served us for many thousands of years to be that way because it was very dangerous back in the days to act boldly. You know, you can end up getting killed. I'm talking like thousands and thousands of years ago. And so we've evolved to have these fears in us and they manifest themselves in all these little stories like imposter syndrome. And some of these fears are valid because we can't, I don't believe that a person can be extremely fearless to the point where they're just not afraid of anything because then you would just drive randomly on the street. You would, Yeah, no, no, that would be insane, yeah. <laughs> right? So, like, th there's a certain degree of, of fearlessness we need to have that we need to develop certain programming that needs to be rewritten in order to produce results. And imposter syndrome is just one of the manifestations of a fear that we have. Yeah, the, the fear thing of is... criticism, you could say. That's the, one of the fears because that's also from Think and Grow Rich. Fear of criticism talks true. Yeah. yeah, and 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 I guess the whole thing is that fear of being, you know, uh, discouraged um, and 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 just not uh, being respected as they wish to or as they wanted to. But actually, there is a, a very good phrase from Seth Godin. Uh, I'm sure you know him, mm. Seth Godin. Yes. Yeah. So you know, I'm a big fan of Seth Godin, and uh, there is one one phrase that I like that he says. The cost of being wrong is less than the cost of doing nothing. So I, I love that because it really resonates with me. If I do something wrong, I wake up next day and say, well, I tried. Yeah, wasn't wasn't really good, was it? <laughs> Sorry. Let's move on. You know, so what can yes. I do now? Yeah. But if I don't do anything, I, I'll just, if I just say, okay, now I'm, I'm too afraid to do it, or I'm not ready, blah, 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 mm -hmm. I'll just be feeling, re I'll, I'll regret the rest of my life for anything, yeah. any little thing, it doesn't matter. So, mm -hmm. and in contrary, there are so many people that I see that I say, please watch yourself. You are a wonderful singer, or you are a wonderful artist, you are a wonderful engineer. Why don't you really pursue what you want to do? Why don't you believe yourself? You know? And then that's what I, where I was telling you that I have close friends and families yeah. that. They just don't see it. And I don't know what else to say to them because they just don't see it. Like, oh, no, 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 no. It's uh, thank you for the kind words, but no, I'm not that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. tough. It's tough to, to help, you know, on that. You know, the interesting that's... thing is that the more we break through our own imposter syndrome, the more we recognize that it was actually just all a facade and it was just a smoke screen. And, and so we, we'll start to see this in others. We're like, it's so easy to do that, you know, and I have to take, actually take a step back from that because I train entrepreneurs and I've been on this journey for so long. And a lot of things that I do right now seem easy to me, but I remember in earlier stages how difficult that was psychologically. So I've, oh, I've, I've done a few scenarios where I would, I would tell an entrepreneur, okay, you know, just do this thing. And then they didn't do it. And I was wondering like, how could they not do it? I actually had to reflect back and, and put myself in their place and recognize, Oh, um, in their paradigm, which, you know, has evolved for me in this journey, they're still 
like it's so fearful for them, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what will happen is uh, they won't admit it because, you know, one of the things that we do as humans is we always like to bring our best self to the equation. <laughs> we like to bring the facade, right? So, you know, it, and when they're around somebody that has a certain level of success and so forth, they're going to put on their best behavior. And you're like, oh, you know, you should maybe consider this thing during the consultation. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll consider that. I'll consider that. And it sounds like they're considering it. But meanwhile, they're actually petrified inside. They're like, oh, there's no way I can do what he just said. There's just like, yeah. no way. He's making no way. it easy, but he's crazy. He doesn't know my scenario and stuff. And I think, uh, you know, I learned to recognize that as a, as a coach and consultant and kind of break it back to their level. There's something that I learned uh, from Jeff, actually, Jeff Moore, who I connected with. Um, feel, felt, found, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> I, That's great. You know about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I heard you say that. <laughs> it's it's a it's not a tactic, but it's it's a way of um, expressing empathy towards a person. So it's a uh, it, it's it's a good mental model to revert to when we encounter scenarios like that, where because we've actually been there before and we've overcome it. So it's like you yeah. know, I, I know how you feel, and you help them feel yeah. understood. Um, I felt and, that before when I was in your situation, and here's what I found. Yeah. And like okay, now I'm more likely to break mm. through that. Yeah. And that is something very, very smart from, and uh, thank you for that. Actually, you, you always impress me with your, <laughs> that's something that you said once, but um, it's so true. And I uh, never forget, you said, um, I like to take people from where I've been to where I am now. You know? yes. There are so many people that, uh, you know, that I can help. And I, I thought that thought was brilliant because that's what I do as well. And sometimes I wanted to, rush and get them quickly to where I'm now and I just have to respect that, yeah. that you know the same process that they take me maybe took me a little bit you know less time but mm. everyone has their own process so I have to understand sometimes and I have to do that self-talk with myself okay wait a minute don't push it too hard because you know you've been there they are there just try to help them with whatever tools you can to get to the place you are yeah being a place of security of uh, being you know, confidence or whatever it is. But uh, I love that phrase that you said. Uh, you know, and that oh. applies really well to the world of business too, because um, I like to have a portfolio of deals on the table and some will move slower than others because of dynamics like that. And some will move rapidly fast. Mm -hmm. So when you're hedged and you're diversified, you're okay with that because it's, you don't have all your eggs in one basket and you're dependent on it because then you're just going to be a disservice to the other person and yourself. So yeah. I, I like, I like using that same metaphor. I'm using the what if again in another area, <laughs> diversifying your business uh, initiatives and so forth so that you can operate a lot smoother. Yeah. Now that's, a, that's a brilliant concept because another thing from that phrase that you said, I don't remember which book you, you, you doing the study notes, but I just kept going back and, and thinking about that phrase, you know, because uh, following that thought, you said also, you mentioned that sometimes we're looking to someone that is, you know, really successful, mm -hmm. uh, far away from we, where we are now. And then yes. we look at them and it's like, oh, it's so hard to be there. How can I be there? Maybe mm -hmm. I'll never get to that stage, no? Yeah. So there is still, you know, uh, different spots where you are here and you wanted to become that and in, you, ha you wanted to try to help that one that is there. So how do you actually get to that point where you are fine with both, you know, find that there's a process to get there to that other space and then help the other ones to get to where you are. Yeah. You know, I've gone through a different phase. I'm, I'm, I'm a very driven person and I've always been like that. So I tend to bias more on, on the side of, Oh, I want to be there. I want to be there. I want to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and I recognized that it actually was not good for me because it messed up current scenarios because I'd always be wondering what it was like there, but not valuing here and so forth. So I came up with a, a good way of being just internally and just litmus testing, engaging myself to make sure that I'm enjoying both the process and the journey and the micro achievements on the way to that end result, right? So for example, you can break it down really Mac, uh, really granular. For example, when you run a campaign, let's say a marketing campaign, let's you're doing some paid advertising, right? So you run a paid advertising campaign and the goal is obviously to bring in sales. So you run the campaign and you put in like a hundred dollars and you didn't get any sales. Well, a lot of people will get disappointed because they wanted the sales. I've learned to break that down into, into micro steps. So I start to look at it from the perspective of, okay, what are all the optimization points and the conversion points? And now how many of those did I succeed in based on the volume of traffic flow? 
And based on what's working, how can I leave those elements while optimizing these other elements? Because I got success here. This is successful. Like this is actually a success, this part. So I'm happy about that. But these, part are, these parts are not. So stuff like that, you create these little, I wouldn't call it games, actually. It's more of a, a rational way of looking at, at reality, oh, right? You, know, you, are brilliant. you are a brilliant mind. I don't just grab you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so this is the interesting thing is that um, I learned a lot of these things just through focus of um, self-evaluation and the, the very things that I was working on, right? And then when you start to recognize that it works in this area, it also works in another area. So, so that's what, that's what creates this, this, I won't say illusion of brilliant mind, but this is what creates this perception of a brilliant no, mind. No, it's not an illusion. <laughs> now, you, uh, imposter syndrome, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you want to see how well I handle criticism. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> testing you, I'm testing you. <laughs> right, so, so, Joseph. If we have anyone, especially here in Europe, in Barcelona, that would like to contact you, or I know you do also some speaker engagements, you are, you have multi you have all the trainings, but you also are in events and so on, speaking to, to large audiences, conferences. So if, if anyone wants to, to contact you, hire you, where, what's the process? Where should they um, go through to an email, to your site? Where, what's the best way? I can go to my website, josephrodriguez.com. There's a contact form there. Yeah. And, okay. uh, oh, there's a contact form. Okay. We yeah, will uh, uh, add this also to the channel today, all the information, so everyone can check uh, here on, on the video. But uh, I'll leave the, the information from your site and uh, obviously your YouTube channel. Any, you. any other? F any, that's it. So from the website is the best way. Just leave yeah. the I have the other site, the online training for entrepreneurs. It has a little chat box on it. If I'm if I'm online and working, it'll say online. You can drop me a message on there. Really? Oh, that's a little chat thing on there. Um, if I'm not around, it'll say away, and I would just get the message. But those are probably the best ways to get a hold of me is the josephrodriguez.com or that online training for entrepreneurs site. Fantastic, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, my dear Joseph, if you are coming to Barcelona this August this year, and yeah. I take you to surf. We're gonna, we're gonna give a gift to your followers. <laughs> I wanted to make a promise right here. I'm gonna record you, and we're gonna post this video online. <laughs> Are we gonna start a YouTube channel on learning how to surf? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> step by step, and I'll be. And, and yeah, you you be the surfing coach, and I would be the trainee, and and you know I would go through the process of. <laughs> And then it would be like a, a, a whatever, 50 part for, for me to learn how to surf, maybe a hundred part. Well, but like, you know. It always starts how to fall. I, you know, I remember when I was teaching my husband, I said, you have to learn how to fall because if you fall, you know, depending how you do, you can really hurt yourself. So like, you know, that's else, very like, metaphorical for business. Too. You've got to learn how to fall, right? <laughs> very much. I knew you would say that. <laughs> so Joseph, oh, thank you so me much. Out. You don't need to hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful to have you here. Thank you so yeah, much. Likewise. Thank you. And, uh, I'll see you next time soon, hopefully in Barcelona. Take care. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs> right, Looking guys, forward to more, much more. Right. Come on, kisses, French kisses. <laughs> Four or five times. <laughs> five times. Yeah. Oh, <laughs>